once again, thank you for being here and taking the time to be here and also taking credit for it. We're, this is the Emotional Healing Lecture Series that the CEO, Lawrence Medina, and myself came up with an idea once at lunch about three and a half years ago that we felt we needed a way to give out education to everybody for emotional sobriety, for sobriety, and just emotional growth. So we started these groups up and we had them public and, and they were going very well and then COVID hit. And so we bumbled around for a while and then we started them back up this year. And if you ever want to see one that you haven't seen or you choose to see this one again, they're on the Rio Grande ATP a website. So this is the Emotional Healing Lecture Series that's sponsored by Rio Grande ATP. For those of you that don't know, Rio Grande ATP is a substance use disorder program that takes care of the drug courts in large part of northern New Mexico, some of the domestic violence courts as well as DWI courts, as well as good old recovery intensive outpatient. It also a big thing about Rio Grande as it's in Raton, Las Vegas and Taos is we really try to take care of the Norteños called Northern New Mexicans through these sort of programs so that we can all have a safer and better life. So with that, I want to introduce Lawrence Medina, who is the chief executive director of Rio Grande and helps us put these on and sponsors them. Lawrence, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, and what a, a privilege. Bien, bienvenidos. Welcome, everybody, to the Emotional Healing Workshop. And like Ted said, you know, one of the visions that we talked about is, is our clients and community being exposed to topics that we don't talk about. In the past, we've had healing trauma, codependency. So these are topics that are not talked about. I'm also, in addition to being the ex uh, executive director, I'm also a person in long-term re recovery. And what that means, I haven't had a drink or drug in over 31 years. And I'm a former client of Rio Grande and, and, and got uh, sober in Taos. So I've been there. Uh, Rio Grande has, was established in 1978, well known for its rehab center in Embudo, and we had residential in Mora in Las Vegas. And uh, so we've been around a lot here in the north and, um, and just so grateful for this opportunity that we've been doing over the years. Grateful to Ted and also Golden Willow Counseling has been a partner uh, in the past and currently just to acknowledge. But again, this is for you and your growth. You know, that, that, that we put our primary purpose is individuals that are wanting to improve their life. Well, this is why we put it. It's free. And we appreciate your time and being respectful during this. And with that, I'm not going to take up any more time. Thank you, Ted. Thanks, Lawrence. And thanks for everything you're doing and trying to help out all of northern New Mexico as well as the nation. You speak all over the country and you have tried to help in many different areas so that we can have a safer world. And instead of just survive, actually thrive. And so appreciate that big time. Um, and with that, um, I want to introduce Gilbert Valdez and I get to give him a little smack for the beginning just because, uh, because we go way back and we know that smack is part of our fun. And so when I first met Gilbert, he was a new young therapist working for Team Builders Counseling and came up to the Taos with his almost brand new wife um they're getting married and uh and one day i was like gilbert you're just way too brilliant and you just don't need to push that ladder so hard he went okay and the next day he just like calmed down used his brilliance and became one of the most amazing therapists i've ever met and realized we don't get to push rivers we get to try to help support and watching him grow over the years and outgrow me with his brilliance and his work has been such an honor and Gilbert now works in Albuquerque and I'll let him tell more of that those pieces that he works in um, he works well what our title is community violence grief trauma and self-care and I asked Gilbert after he had done a class for me from Southwestern College on trauma and I also know the work he does and I was like Gilbert you know there's so many shootings now, and there's so much trauma in our world, and there's so much violence. How can anybody ever get out of a fear state, out of a trauma state? 
And I said, Gilbert, will you please come and talk to our group so that we can record this and get it out to the community? And, um, and he did, which luckily he's willing to say yes to me, just like I'll say yes to him. And, uh, and with that, I want to introduce Gilbert Valdez and I want to honor his esposa who's somewhere on here. And thanks for being here as well. And Gilbert, love you bunches and just appreciate you being here. And I'm turning the floor over to you and I'm going to mute myself. And thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Uh, you always hype me up, Ted. And uh, <laughs> I really appreciate that you gassed me up. And, uh, you you know, when you asked me to do this, I'm like, Ted always has always believed in me. And so uh, how can I say no? You know, I got to make I got to make you proud. <clears throat> I got other people to make proud. And, and we're doing some good work, and I'm happy to share that with you. So, everyone, uh, my name is Gilbert Valdez. It's an honor to be here with, with all of you all, uh, wherever you are. Um, you know, like Ted said, this is a big topic. There's one, two, three, four topics that in and of themselves um, can be a two-hour lecture, you know. But um, anyone that knows me knows that I like a challenge, and so... What I, what I put together for you all tonight, I think is going to be worthy of our time. And, you know, this isn't going to be an in-depth lecture about any singular one of these topics specifically, uh, because this is so broad, right? Um, I was running through this presentation last night with my wife and she's like, man, this is broad, you know? So we're going to try to touch on a couple of different things and what I've, what I've really tried to identify for us is uh, some of the connective tissue between these things. Okay, and so we're going we're gonna to look at those. Uh, I reviewed the literature on community violence. We're going to define that. And uh, I've also included some current events uh, that we're seeing in the news, uh, examples of community violence and community justice as well. And, you know, I because of the nature of the topic, you know, we're going to talk about some public things, some things that are in the news, some things that are difficult. And uh, I'm my intention is not to make a political statement on this uh, presentation. These are my own opinions. Uh, and I'm more interested in the psychological aspects of the intersection of these topics. You know, I'm a clinician. Um, we think differently. We say weird things. If if someone said they were feeling hot, I'd say something like their inner child was probably playing with matches. You know, we, we, so I'm going to try to give you guys some of that flavor of um, a different kind of point of view for some of these things. Okay. And my hope is that uh, this presentation leaves you all with some things to contemplate, maybe some insight into some things, and also that it reaffirms some things that you already know to be deeply true that aren't often verbalized, kind of what Lauren said earlier, um, having some chatting about things that aren't spoken of often. So we're gonna display some vulnerability today. I know I am. And my hope is that uh, the, the, the message underneath is that it's okay to discuss these things. It's okay to have conversations about things around the table. Um, and we're gonna talk about that too. So, okay, so who I am, uh, I've been married 10 years to my beautiful wife, Susan. Uh, I'm a father to three young girls under four. We have a set of twins. That's uh, Charlie Ivy and Hazel. Hazel's our four-year-old. Um, we, I have a bachelor's in psychology. I have a master's degree in counseling. And I've been an independently licensed clinician for about a little over a decade now, uh, seeing people, treating people in clinic. Uh, I'm a mobile crisis therapist with Burnley County, uh, Burnley County Behavioral Health. And I'm partnered with uh, Bernalillo County Fire Department paramedics uh, currently. And we're going to talk about what that work looks like as a mental health first responder. I also do psychiatric evaluations for the Loveless Health System here in Albuquerque. We have three different hospitals. And so I get called to go speak with people who are acutely suicidal or homicidal psychotic, excuse me, uh, to see how we can help them. Um, I also do a little personal training. Uh, I have a couple clients that I am helping them with their health. And I do some martial arts and uh, fitness is really an uh, integral part of my life. And we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So objectives. After this lecture, you will be able to describe the effects of community violence on health. You'll be able to list some of the factors that influence violence. 
define alexithymia and explain its implications, as well as identify strategies to be some body. So a trigger warning, like I said, these topics are sensitive. And uh, I know a lot of us have experienced community violence. We've experienced interpersonal violence. And the, the topics in and of themselves and some of the images that we're gonna look could be activating for us. I intentionally chose not to show anything that is like gory or too sensationalized. That's not the point of this discussion, right? I'm trying not to activate us in that way, uh, even myself. So, uh, so again, take care of yourself, you know, do what you need to do. Make sure you're uh, stretching and drinking fluids and all the things. Okay. So again, my name is Gilbert. Um, some of the pictures up here, we'll walk through them. Uh, I, in talking with people about this, this, this presentation, I was asking some of my close friends, like, what was their thoughts on community violence? How do they define that? And what I came to find is everyone defined that from a very personal place, right? Uh, an, a, a subjective place uh, based on their experience. So uh, we all have a personal relationship to the topic that we're going to discuss about. And you know, each, each of you, I'd even uh, encourage you, like, what does it mean when someone says uh, community violence? What does that mean to you, right? Uh, for me personally, in my youth, uh, I was a victim of sexual abuse. Uh, I grew up in a house full of uh, family members who had mental illness and had addiction problems, uh, alcoholism. Uh, me and my mother and sisters, we were homeless for periods of our time. We lived in cars, we lived in hotels. Uh, because of the chaos and the nature of what happens when people are on substances, uh, which we're going to discuss as well. Um, I've been sober about four years, going on five years. Before Hazel was born, I decided that was something important for me. I didn't want to, uh, not that I even had a, uh, necessarily a problem, at least clinically with alcohol. I just didn't get anything out of alcohol. Um, so I don't use anything else. Um, in my family, we have several people, and my extended family, my large extended family, uh, large Hispanic family. Some of my family members are on here, so thanks for showing up. Um, we've had several deaths due to overdoses um, from drugs. Um, and so, you know, my relationship to, to community violence and interpersonal violence is I'm intimately related to these things, um, you know. I've witnessed domestic violence my whole life, you know, even as an adult uh, now. And so it's, it's something that's, uh, when people talk about these things, I have a higher threshold for, for these things, you know, and uh, trauma will reset your thermostat, your internal thermostat for these things. When uh, I take the uh, ACEs test, the adverse childhood experiences, I score a perfect 10, right? 10 the worst you can get, you know, and what, the test for ACEs shows is um, kids who experience four or more ACEs, they have a 10 times greater chance of intravenous drug use, attempted suicide, two to three times greater risk for developing heart disease, cancer, and they have a 32 uh, times greater chance of learning and behavioral problems, emotional problems. Um, and, you know, when I learned about ACEs a long time ago, it scared me. Um, you know, I, I don't want to have disease. And I've been fortunate to stave off some of these diseases as I've gotten older. And uh, it's being healthy uh, it has been important to me. So I, I have this sense, though, that it's coming for me. And, and eventually, you know, uh, it's going to catch up to me if, if, if what ACEs says is true. If you haven't looked at ACEs, I, you know, I would encourage you to go look at uh, these ACEs inventories, okay? If uh, there was a poster child for trauma, I think I'd be it, you know. Uh, people have said that I'm wise in my, in my youth. Ted mentioned it earlier, um, which I appreciate. And I, I always come back to like, it's probably because the trauma, you know, I've had to grow up and I've had to mature uh, in a lot of ways. And you know, when you grow up with parents uh, with alcoholism or drug addiction, we become parentified really young and we over function for the family so we can uh, make up for these things. And those things have been true for me. I, uh, I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. Um, 
we have trauma. Dum, da, dum, 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 dum. So if uh, Allstate wants me to be their <laughs> poster boy for that, I can do it. Um, but I've also had positive childhood experiences. You know, the literature coming out on how we offset the negative effects of adverse childhood experiences is, is really coming through now. Uh, and usually what that looks like is there was a single adult, some friends, healthy older people who were there to help be supportive. And what, what the research shows is that these PCEs, positive childhood experiences, can uh, offset and mitigate ACEs, right? So that's, that's, uh, that's helpful, that's hopeful. Um, my life really turned around in high school. Uh, I got into football and I quit that. I got into wrestling and I've been a wrestler my whole life. Um, it really set the tone for the importance of health and fitness in my life. And uh, it, wrestling really taught me that I could be uh, in touch with my body and that I could be uh, powerful and strong. Uh, when I got to college, I started a wrestling club called the Greyhound Grapplers. I went to Eastern New Mexico University. I got a bunch of guys that knew different disciplines and that turned into a, a mixed martial arts club called Greyhound MMA. And we, uh, we fought uh, a couple times in 2008, 2009. You can see up there in the right-hand corner, some pictures of me cage fighting, wonderful times in my life. Uh, I preserve, I stopped uh, before graduate school because I needed to preserve my uh, neurological functioning. Uh, but I still train today and I still train martial arts. I still help people learn uh, martial arts. Um, and now me and my wife, you know, we work out, we're really big into fitness. You can see a picture there of uh, me pulling Hazel on a bike. Uh, I have some of my mates here, you know, my buddies, Mark and Olin. Uh, we hiked Wheeler Peak a couple years ago. We hiked Santa Fe Baldy two years ago. Uh, we always try to hike the tallest things we can find. And they're just as crazy as me. So that's, that always helps. What's important about fitness for me is when my mind and my body are in the same place, um, when my mind and body are in the same place, that's when I feel the most alive. Um, so my, you know, my past connects me to my present, right? And that really helps me in my work as a mental health first responder. So as a mental health first responder, you can see some of these pictures here. Um, we wear ballistic uh, armor, uh, Kevlar vests for some of our calls um, right there in the middle. On the very top, uh, we, we, you know, that was me receiving some training about how to use tourniquets just in case we're injured or injured in the, in the limb or the arm. There's massive hemorrhage. Uh, we carry chest seals with us just in case we're shot or hurt in the thorax and we need to close a wound. Um, we get basic first aid training and a bunch of other training. You can see some of the pictures here from some of my, uh, my partners of the past, uh, some detectives with the sheriff's department. And now my partners uh, currently are Andy and uh, Woody in the green shirts there. I like to say when we get on scene, this is Andy, this is Woody, and I'm Buzz Lightyear because that's just a weird mix of how we all got together and it breaks the ice, you know. And as a mental health first responder um, and being exposed to like what police see every day and uh, paramedics and firefighters see, it's it's incredible the amount of community violence that these professions see. And now I get to see it too. We get to see interpersonal violence. Uh, we get to see self-violence. We deal with a lot of people who are calling 911 or someone's calling 911 for them because they're self-harming or they're having suicidal ideations or they're doing non-suicidal self-injury. Um, and now with the current wave in the nation here in Albuquerque, I know there's some other places in New Mexico, specifically Las Cruces, Santa Fe, uh, we have these kind of alternative response teams like myself, where there's like a licensed clinician or a social worker uh, who's been asked to step out of the clinic and step into like a first responder role uh, to protect the community in some different type of way. Uh, and, you know, who would have guessed that clinicians, mental health clinicians and social workers uh, are now in the realm of public safety right? We are asked to uh, come and assess people and talk with people, provide resources. Uh, usually we are assessing people for uh, threat or uh, threat assessment or risk assessment, uh, threats to themselves, threats to the community. We get called 
from the 911 system anywhere to schools. We've been asked to come to schools to talk to kids who have made threats to, that they're going to bring the gun or that they are, are they have a gun. Uh, we are asked to come, man, we've talked to people on the top of, top of the crest. It's very high up there. We've talked to people in every part of Bernalillo County. And, uh, you know, we're, we're doing our best to engage with these individuals uh, in a dignified and respectful way. They're humans just like us. They're probably having the worst day of their life. And uh, in some way, they're desperate. They want some type of change, and they don't know how to achieve that, right? And so we try to link them up with resources. We try to get them help um, to try to steer them and knock them off the direction and the course that they're going. One of our big goals is to actually keep people in the community if they don't need to go to the hospital. And we're trying to reduce the use, uh, inappropriate use of like emergency services, going to the ER, taking up a bed. Um, and we're trying to maintain them in their, in their community, in their family, as best as we possibly can, if that's possible. That, that's, that's sometimes very difficult, right? Because some people don't have anyone uh, to watch them or call them. We're providing an alternative response, uh, sometimes to police response. We have gone on several calls where there's no law enforcement involved. And I'm super proud to say that we've had very positive outcomes um, a majority of the time. I can't even think of a negative, a negative outcome that we've had. Um, several of the individuals who we've dealt with here in the Albuquerque community, you know, who are severely mentally ill, um, we know that those individuals have a shorter lifespan because their life is hard. It's very hard. Um, and I can understand that, you know, coming from the background that I, that I've come, that I've come from, um, every call that I'm on, you know, I'm kind of interacting with my parents and people in my family. So I always have that in the back of my head. We, uh, have no weapons on us. That's not something we carry. We're not equipped to that. Uh, my, my team now, obviously when I was riding with the sheriff's department and Albuquerque police department, um, we were riding with an officer who has a, a firearm. And so that always changes the dynamic of the encounters that you have when you're bringing a gun to a fight, right? Or to an encounter. Uh, and that's how police think too. So it's been really interesting in this role observing the police department and the fire department and really deeply understanding what they go through and how they interact with the public and the community. And I, I have to tell you guys, that's a very difficult job, not one that I want to do. You couldn't pay me to do that. Um, funny enough, when me and my, my law enforcement partners talk about this, they say, well, we wouldn't do the job that you're doing. You know, we, you can pay us to be a therapist. So I guess it works out uh, the partnership that we've created with some of these, these departments. One of the skill sets that I have uh, and my, my, my counselors and clinicians and social workers that are maybe viewing this um, or who, were, who are going to view this, you know, every day when I walk up into an encounter to talk with someone who's having a crisis, I use my basic micro counseling skills. You know, um, I use nonviolent uh, verbal de-escalation if I can verbally engage with them and they're willing to talk with me. Uh, I use a lot of empathy. I use a lot of open-ended questions, paraphrase things. I reflect things. Um, one of my gifts, I think, is really trying to understand where someone's from. You know, the definition of empathy is um, I will walk kind of in your shoes or um, I'm not just going to observe your suffering, but I'm going to suffer with you, right? It takes, uh, I think, a lot of training to master that. And, uh, you know, Ted's an expert at this. Ted's a guru. I'm, I consider myself kind of like an intermediate. I'm, I'm good at what I do, but someday I hope I can be Ted, you know? Um, and, you know, one of the things that we do in engaging with people is we're just trying to figure out what their needs are, Right. What are their goals? What are their desires? We, we can cut an encounter really quickly by just kind of asking them, like, what do you need? What's missing in your life? What's going to help you uh, to improve? And, you know, sometimes just getting that question answered and helping them to identify that, um, it just cools the temperature down, especially when someone is really angry or upset, anxious or manic um, or psychotic. Our job is to bring the temperature down so we can have a conversation. 
We're going to talk about state dependent functioning later on um, a little bit so we can understand that as well. So I love the work that I, I get to do uh, at the hospitals, in the field. I feel like I was called to do this work. I feel like I was made to do this type of work. So let's start off with a parable. Two young fish were swimming in the ocean and an older fish passes by and the older fish looks at one of the fish and says, hey boys, how's the water today? And they swim off. Later on, the two young fish are swimming and one looks at the other one and says, what the hell is water, right? What the hell is water? Every day we're bombarded with more tragic news on the micro and in the macro, in our personal lives, locally and internationally. Um, the internet has allowed us to be hyper-connected, allowing us to be hyper-aware of like what's happening in other countries. Um, and some of us are still grieving and reeling from the events of the past two years, such as the pandemic. You know, COVID-19 has killed a hundred, a uh, million, a million Americans and six million people globally. Um, some of us have lost family members, friends, colleagues, um, and the collective grief is just at an all-time high. You know, um, we're we're kind of getting news about monkeypox and it's kind of causing some fear and panic as well. So there are these, these vectors that are happening as well that we're, we're dealing with, right? And coronavirus and other viruses, you know, they don't fall neatly into the category of like community violence, but a violence is being perpetuated on our, our fellow, fellow man and the human loss is great, you know? We're still kind of dealing with the fallout from the violence that occurred in the summer of 2020 with the political violence happening, uh, especially after the murder of George Floyd. Uh, we had several incidents of police violence during that time as well. That's kind of coming out now. We had a turbulent 2020 election and, you know, we had a prior president attempt to stay in power and Several people died on January 6th of that year, uh, last year, or 2020. And the fallout of that is still occurring today. We've had um, just recently in the news, the abuse and death of indigenous children in Canada's residential school systems come out. It's this huge thing. Uh, the prime minister there, Justin Trudeau, has been making statements about that. And for those of us that have Native American uh, heritage, you know, that is so deeply unsettling and disturbing. Um, and if you know the history of America, it's not, it's not too far too similar from what happened in Canada, you know, regarding uh, genocide. We have the recent uh, SCOTUS over ruling overturning of settled law, Roe versus Wade. Uh, that just came out. We have the fear that SCOTUS is going to overturn Obergefell versus Hodges in Lawrence v. Texas. And for our uh, uh, LGBTQ community, that is deeply terrifying and unsettling as well, right? We have the war in Ukraine that's still raging today. We're still getting news about that uh, every day. It seems to have fallen off, you know, that 24-hour news cycle. Um, lots of death there. I just saw something Second, before we got onto this thing, that there was bombings in Russia at a base. So, you know, there's war happening right now in other places of the world, and we are imbibing this news. And what do we do with it, right? And we're going to talk about that. We have climate change and global warming. That is scary. And that's happening every day. That's influencing our. Uh, weather patterns, we're having more hot days. Locally, a lot of us up north, we've been dealing with Calf Canyon and Hermit's Peak. We had Black Fire down south and several other fires. Um, it's a good day here in Albuquerque because it just rained. We just had this beautiful rain. Hazel and I were out swimming. We were swimming in the rain. And so I'm sending rain up north for you all. The other side of that coin is that it's monsoon season. So the people that just got told to evacuate from Hermit's Peak uh, and then they got to go home when the fire out got out. Now they're telling telling them to leave again because guess what? There's flooding in their in their community. So 
there's a lot of tragedy happening every day. And um, there's daily mass shootings occurring in the world. And we're going to touch on that as well. Um, got a picture there of Rob Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. The hits keep coming, folks. And it feels like a torrential downpour at times. It's overwhelming. Uh, it feels like it never stops. But this is just the water that we're swimming in. If you're feeling overwhelmed, even just by this discussion on this slide, right? We could probably wrap up this presentation now that it's, it's over. Um, yeah, that's appropriate to feel overwhelmed. It's appropriate to feel sick. It's appropriate to feel angry. It's appropriate to feel sad, right? We're literally living through uh, history for the past two years. So before we get into this definition, I just want to encourage you all to check in with yourself, take a breath. I'm going to take my own advice. Stuff like the last slide we saw is activating, right? I can even feel myself feeling a little hot just because of the nature of what we're talking about. So go ahead and do that. Take a breath. Okay. I promise this is like the wordiest slide in the whole presentation. Okay. So let's read this definition, right? Community violence, what is it? This is like the scholastic definition. Community violence is exposure to intentional acts of interpersonal violence committed in public areas by individuals who are not intimately related with the victim. Common types of community violence that affect the youth Affect youth include individual and group conflicts, bullying, fights among gangs, other groups, shootings in public areas such as schools and communities, civil wars like in Ukraine, or warlike conditions. In US cities, spontaneous terrorist attacks also kind of qualify in its definition. Although people can anticipate some types of traumatic events, community violence can happen suddenly and without warning. Consequently, youth and families who live with community violence often have heightened fears that harm could come at any time and experience the world is unsafe and terrifying. In addition, although some types of trauma are accidental, community violence is an intentional uh, attempt to hurt one or more people and includes homicides, sexual assaults, robberies, and weapons attacks such as bats, knives, and guns. The National Child Traumatic Stress Network made that definition. A single neighborhood murder can affect up to 200 people. Uh, youth exposed to violence are at a greater risk of aggression, substance use, abuse, uh, adult criminality when they get older, depression, anxiety, and other mental health problems. It affects the whole community, uh, not just the individuals who are exposed to it, right? Higher exposure to community violence is positively associated with internalizing mental health symptoms. So people who are exposed to this stuff, um, they can have a higher incidence rate of like anxiety, depression, PTSD, uh, clinical diagnoses as well. And living in these communities where there's a shooting or um, some type of gang violence or a homicide, um, people that live in these communities, they experience they experience this violence and that's associated with an increased risk of developing chronic disease. You know, we talked about ACEs, even an ACE, what's funny about ACEs is ACEs doesn't even include stuff that happens outside of the home. That's all it's stuff inside of the home. Um, concerns about violence may prevent people from engaging in healthy habits, such as walking, bicycling, going to the park, using recreational spaces, accessing healthy food outlets. Um, what we know about people exposed to community violence is the community starts to live more sedentary lives, right? They stop going outside. They stop going to the store. They stop going to the movie theater. Um, we just recently traveled and, and I was crossing my fingers that something wouldn't happen on the plane or at the airport. I was praying that nothing happened at the uh, amusement parks that we went to. And so I, I can understand that. I can definitely understand that. And again, it kind of has parallels to COVID where it was like, well, we don't want to go out because it's out there. It's going to get us. Um, so thankful for the vaccines. I'm a believer in the vaccines. And uh, 
I think that's allowed us to have some uh, restoration of like normalcy back in our lives, at least leaving the home. So there's another definition of community violence. I like this definition, I included it. Community violence is a type of interpersonal violence that occurs among individuals outside of personal relationship. It includes acts that occur in the streets or within institutions such as schools and workplaces. In addition, community violence can be experienced directly, you're a victim of violence or indirectly witness and hearing about. I think a lot of us who don't experience it personally, we fall into the latter category now, you know? Again, every day we open our phones and there's boom, there's some tragic news about a mass shooting or something happening. And so we're, we're exposed to that at, at higher levels. I, and I don't think it was that was the case when before the ubiquitous nature of cell phones, right? Especially cell phones with the internet and social media. So um, you'd have to get your news from the paper back in the good old days or on TV, right? You'd watch the news. You'd just talk about it over the water cooler with your to your colleagues. And strangely enough, one of the factors that increases aggressive behavior is temperature. So what we know is that when temperature alone rises in the world, in your part of the world, violence does the same. There's a correlation between heat and violence. Um, in 2021, that was the world's sixth warmest year on record, right? Um, and it's only getting hotter, you know, if the science around man-made global warming is true. Uh, one study out of Spain found that the risk of intimate partner femicides, the death of a female or homicide of a female, it increased three days after a heat wave. Um, that same study said that uh, the risk of police reports increased one day after a heat wave. That same study found that uh, the risk of helpline calls increased five days after a heat wave, and heat waves were associated with increase in intimate partner violence. Another study based on 19,523 intentional homicides were found, uh, they found a linear temperature homicide uh, association, that there was an increase in intentional homicides over a lag of zero to seven days in Chicago and New York but not other studies that uh, other cities that they studied in that study specifically. There was another study out of Baltimore that reported when adjusting for temporal and meteorological factors, a maximum daily temperature was positively associated with total trauma, intentional injuries and gunshot wounds that presented to John Hopkins hospital uh, along with total crime, violent crime and homicide again, specifically in Baltimore city. Uh, so we have this evidence that uh, when heat departs from like our normal ranges, right? It's been, let's see what the temperature is in Albuquerque today. It was 91 degrees today with the clouds. When that gets just a little bit above a hundred, um, you know, uh, if, if the research is true that there's, there's more uh, a linear positive correlation between there's more violence in the next couple of days. So there's something about heat. There's a lot of research on, uh, on the web out there that, uh, that proves that proves some of this or gives some evidence that this is something that's happening. And again, my suspicion is that as the world gets more hot, the average days of heat and heat waves uh, are kind of more out of the ordinary, out of the ordinary, we're gonna see more community violence. And so <laughs> I hope you didn't get onto this presentation today and being like, Gilbert's gonna say, there's, you know, there's, there's a downfall, there's a decrease in community violence. So, I think what that also says is that we're kind of responsible for some of the things that we're seeing, you know, uh, at least from a communal and societal standpoint. Another factor that influences violence is our beliefs, our values and our cultural influences. As a clinician, I utilize uh, a type of um, a model of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. I help my clients uh, examine their beliefs, their point of view, their values, their cultural myths. And, you know, we attempt to find out if any of those things are getting in the way of them living a life worth living, as they say in DBT. And, you know, the things that 
we believe as people, uh, the things that we tell ourselves and the messaging that we get from our family, our culture, um, they're powerful. They're super powerful. These ideas, the values and myths, uh, they drive our actions and our behavior. And how we spend our time, how we spend our money, it can tell us a lot about ourselves, right? And I love this quote by Gandhi. Um, your beliefs become your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your values. And your values become your destiny, right? And I would ask all of us, as part of the water that we're swimming in as Americans, what are our values as Americans? You know, what is our destiny? There was a uh, black activist uh, during the time of civil rights in the 1967, his name is uh, H. Rat Brown. And he said, violence is American as cherry pie. And the, the graph that you guys are seeing is the amount of money that the U.S. spends on defense, you know. And in 2021, the U.S. spent $801 billion towards defense. Um, and when we talk about national defense, that just means preparation for violence um, of another nation, right? Or protecting ourselves in some way. Um, that amount of money, 8.801 billion, that's 3.3% of our gross domestic product. You know, we're a very rich country comparatively, and we spend a lot of money. Uh, we spend more money than nine other countries combined. Um, some studies are predicting that by 2032, so in a decade, we will be spending just $2 billion shy of a trillion dollars on defense in our country, in our nation. So what are our values if we're devoting all that money to defense, right? Um, that's pretty aggressive, right? Um, and as Americans, we, we kind of take that for granted. Again, that's the water we swim in. We, it's kind of sacrosanct. We kind of don't talk about that. But um, it kind of trickles down to the ground level for all of us. And some of the language that we all use, the, the, the slang we use, the cultural language, the pop cultural language um, could be said to be aggressive or have an aggressive flavor, right? So. Here's some examples. Uh, you're giving someone kudos uh, on doing something well, and we say, man, you killed it. Or when we feel confident about performing something well, we say, I'm going to, I murdered that, right? Or uh, even our psychiatrists, they tell us that uh, taking our medications will combat depression or combat anxiety. There's a few other examples. We can tell someone that they're awesome by saying, you're the bomb. <laughs> when we're bored, we say, we're killing time. When we're fending off the haters left and right, we say we're rolling with the punches. That's a, a boxing, a boxing met metaphor, right? And the Beastie Boys, you know, even the Beastie Boys, they had it right when they said you got to fight for your right to party. And my personal favorite, when we offer encouragement to our friends by saying, slay girl, slay. I hope you guys are chuckling. I can't hear your laughter. Uh, but that's just part of who we are, right? That's the kind of language that we use. Uh, can you guys think of some values, beliefs, cultural ideals, myths that we have as uh, Americans? What are some of the values that we have as Americans? Some of the even cultura that we have that um, you guys can think of. I wrote a list. I'll share, I'll share my list with you guys. But these things drive our behavior, right? Uh, we have uh, values like individualism. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps, right? Rugged individualism. We believe in equality, achievement. Um, and I, I drive everywhere in Albuquerque like my house is on fire and I need to go get like the only bucket of water in Albuquerque. Uh, we move fast. We have some friends that are from overseas in, in uh, the UK and they have like a completely different tone to their life. Uh, you know, we're like on the calendar, this, 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 everything's scheduled. And my, you know, we're getting, uh, we're getting invitations for something that they're doing like tomorrow, you know, so it's just a different, uh, a different value system. We believe in materialism here in America. Time is important. Time is really important. Assertiveness, um, all people can participate in government, nationalism, patriotism, 
freedom of speech, our orthodoxy, our beliefs, they influence our orthopraxy, right? And that's just a big word, religious word for uh, proper conduct or our conduct. So, um, okay. Yeah, exactly. I'm looking at the chat here. Real men don't cry. Exactly. That's killing us, brother. And we're going to talk about that too. We're going to talk about emotional constriction when we get to the kind of the, the trauma part. Any other uh, ideas that you can think of? Okay. All right. Um, what about gun culture? in America, how does that influence our behaviors, right? We have some really deep myths about the wild, wild west. And we in New Mexico, we're smack dab in that, right? We got Billy the Kid's grave just a little bit a while down the road in uh, Fort Sumner, you know, um, gun culture drives some of our beliefs and our behaviors. Approximately 300 and 93 million firearms are in civilian hands in the US, or that's about 120.5 firearms per 100 people. There's more firearms than there are people, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's, you know, as we look at this uh, graph here, um, an international comparison of gun related killings is a percentage of homicide. You know, the US compared to other rich countries, we're at 79%. So all the homicides that occur in the United States, 79% of those are because of gun related violence. So it's no surprise folks that um, a country with the most firearms possessed by its citizenry, citizenry, the most, the country that spends the most out of every other nation on defense um, and we're a country that has laws that make it easy to access firearms, that we have a problem with gun violence, right? Um, and what's strange is, again, other rich countries don't have this same problem at the level the US does. Other um, countries have the same levels of mental illness, the same levels of uh, substance use uh, disorders and, and um, other problems, but we're right up there with the poor countries in the amount of violence that we have because of gun violence and just specifically homicides in general. So um, some of those poor countries that have higher rates of gun violence uh, or gun death tend to be uh, South American countries like Venezuela and El Salvador. And again, what stands out is that we're a rich country. So let's look at some, some murder rates, okay? Um, to put this, to, to frame this discussion, to put this into context. Um, we're going to talk about murder rates per uh, 100,000 of people in, you know, in whatever nation we're talking about. So in El Salvador, there's about 36.8 murders uh, per 100,000 people, like in a yearly rate. Um, in Venezuela, it's 33.3 uh, per 100,000 people. Steven Pinker, who we're going to meet in a second, he says, you know, if the rate of homicide is around 50 to 100,000 um, people, your chances, uh, excuse me, a homicide may affect your life. Someone you know may be murdered, someone that, that's close to you or a friend group or a friend of a friend, right? So uh, I feel like when we hear the news and we hear, you know, so-and-so was shot and killed or something happened to them, it kind of feels personal because it's in our community, right? Even here in Albuquerque, today we found out that there were four Muslim brothers that were gunned down in the last couple of months and they caught the guy or they suspect they caught the guy today. And he's, he's also uh, Middle Eastern, right? And so the people I know in my circle, someone's affected by that because they knew that guy or one of those guys. And finally, uh, when the murder rate or the homicide rate is 100 per 100,000 per Steven Pinker, your chances of being killed is more likely when you just leave your house, right? It's more likely when you, when you leave your house um, why is it that uh, these poor countries like El Salvador and Venezuela, they have gang violence, severe gang violence, cartel, drug trafficking kind of problems. Um, they have like uh, as equal um, terrible percentage of gun homicides like us. It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. And again, uh, 
you know, here in orange, it says uh, the USA in 2019, our homicide rate for, for um, nationally on average is four to 100,000 people. That's low, folks. But it doesn't feel low when we're just getting terrible news. And, you know, that's the clickbait stuff that the news puts out because they're trying to get views and streams and whatever advertising. So um, some of our reaction is disproportionate to the actual risk of harm to us. I don't know. Maybe that's what they want. Now that's Steven Pinker there. He wrote two books called uh, Enlightenment Now and The Better Angels of Our Nature. And, and Pinker asserts that um, we're actually living in the, one of the most uh, civil and uh, safest times in the history of humanity, right? Compared to, think about people in, in antiquity um, and even in the last couple of years. I wonder when he updates his statistic, statistics, when he considers COVID and the gun violence now and the war in Ukraine, I wonder if he changes perception on that. So here in my home city of Albuquerque, as some of you know, last year in 2021, we broke a record. We had the most homicides that we've had in the history of New Mexico. We had 117 homicides. And here in uh, 2022, we're on track to break that record. Again, we're at 77, 71 homicides as of last month on the 18th. And again, now we put those four Muslim brothers into that category. We're at 75. Um, what's also unique to the United States and is part of the water that we're swimming in is daily mass shootings. Um, as of the 24th of last, uh, or excuse me, of today, I looked today, I looked at the statistics, there have been 471 mass shootings. And that's like, I think they define it as like more than one victim and someone had an intention to, to harm other people. Again, community violence, that's 2.13 shootings a day. Um, they, they have this uh, mass shooting tracker site uh, online it says that 529 people have been killed and uh, almost 2,000 people have been wounded because of these 471 mass shootings. I'm still terribly shook up over the events at Robb Elementary in Valde, Texas um, last month, uh, excuse me, three months ago feels like it was just last month um, in May where 21 people were shot and killed. 19 of those people were children. Two of those people were teachers. My wife is a teacher. My daughter Hazel is starting pre-K this year. And it's, it's safe to say that I have concerns about them being in the classroom. Guns uh, have become the leading cause of death for American children, surpassing motor vehicle accidents. The leading cause of death is gun violence for children in America. That's the water we're swimming in, folks. Um, and, and I'm concerned, right? And, and I think you guys should be too, um, especially if you have kiddos or you know you have family members who have kiddos and despite steven pinker's commentary that like humanity is the safest that it's ever been because of these um, what he says in one of his books enlightenment era principles um, like science and reason and humanism and the progress um, that are that our that our world is getting better day by day despite negative the negative news in the press and the tragedies of every day um, it still doesn't make me feel confident as a parent, sending my kid and my kids and my wife to school, right? Um, I'm concerned. I'm super concerned about it, actually. Um, those of us that have a trauma history, uh, and some of us, you know, on this on this presentation, you know, we we live in unsafe bodies, and because of that. We live in an unsafe world. It makes us feel unsafe. Um, and when you have hyper arousal and you have, uh, you know, you perceive everyone as a threat, it's difficult to build a relationship. It's difficult to walk in the world. Um, 
because of that, because of these things. And again, the exposure to these daily tragedies, um, it doesn't make us feel any other, any more safe, right? And we're going to talk about that. How do we take care of ourselves during this time, times like these? I think of Viktor Frankl's words, and he says, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. And I'm here to tell you guys that um, if you're feeling disgusted or sick or tired or numb or uncomfortable, you're feeling angry, you're feeling confused, well, yeah, of course you are. Uh, absolutely, me too. Uh, behaviors such as like ble- being glued to the news, um, doom scrolling in your phone, just ha- walking around with a heavy heart, uh, just feeling numb, numbing out, distracting ourselves by all number manner of coping mechanisms. Yeah, that sounds like a normal reaction to the chaos that we're experiencing as a society and, uh, and just in our personal lives, right? How am I supposed to worry about Uvalde, Texas and the tragedy that happened there when I'm dealing with things personally in my own life, right? I don't have space for that stuff. Uh, we get overwhelmed. And, and how many of us are already in this place of being like desensitized being desensitized to the news, right? Where the next thing happens and it's like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. I got to move on with my life, right? Uh, that's a normal reaction, guys, to these abnormal situations. The human body and the human nervous system is made to desensitize and, and, um, and sensitize to any stimulus, right? We become what's called habituated to it. Um, is anyone, does anyone not like wearing tags on their shirts or in their clothes? I'm one of those people. Um, I wear a tag and I, like it immediately bugs me. I got to rip them off um, for whatever reason. I'm, I'm sensitive to that stuff. And uh, people become desensitized to that. You know, you put on your clothes and you don't even know you have clothes on because your body has just become used to that um, constant stimulus over time. That's how our that's how our brains work. That's how our nervous system works. Um, but also in reverse, you know, when we have... Um, traumatic events in our life that um, supercharge our system and we're in fight, flight, or freeze, our nervous system becomes sensitized, right? So a small trigger can have this big reaction. You hear the examples all the time of like the veteran who came home from war, who was in combat, here's a a backfiring muffler, and you know, he's right back in the war. Um, Or someone who has had a, uh, who has been um, raped, or abused in that way, they smell something that smells like their attacker, you know, they're in fight, flight, or freeze, or they shut down. Bessel von der Kolk, he talks about um, trauma, it comes back as a reaction. It doesn't come back as a memory, right? Even though part of PTSD clinically is like intrusive thoughts, and that's part of some other kind of thought disorders. Um, continuous activation of this system that is built to keep us alive. The fight, flight, or freeze system, it it makes us perpetually feel unsafe, right? We're going to watch a small video um, that's made by uh, an organization called Change the Ref, a nonprofit organization started by Manuel and Patricia Oliver, whose son, Joaquin Oliver, was shot and killed at the Parkland High School mass shooting in 2018.
So that video was, again, this um, family who experienced community violence and they, they are so moved to try to enact change and legislative change that they're using art kind of as a disruptive medium to stimulate thought and stimulate growth. Uh, they want people to know how painful this is for them. And I included that they, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to, it's, it's a powerful installation. You know, we're going to go to the Hallmark store, you know, Smith's and you're going to see mass shooting cards. And are we going to accept that that's like normal, a normal behavior because we're just so accustomed to it. Um, Yeah, people ask me, you know, some of the people I talk with, they say like, Gilbert, do you have any solutions for this mass shooting stuff? And I, I don't, I'm not a policy guy. You know, I'm not a politician guy. I just, I just know that um, I want guaranteed safety from gun violence at schools. I want to deeply trust that I can send my babies to school. I can send my wife to school and that they're going to come home to me each day without having to ever experience the terror of an active shooter, you know, and all the research that I've been looking at, it says, you know, we really got to look at gun violence as a, as a public health concern uh, versus like a political issue. And once we do that, we might be able to come up with some novel policies. So we're almost to our break guys. Let's go um, one more slide and then we'll take a break. All right. Thank you. So in, in a vicious cycle, uh, community violence can breed post-traumatic stress, substance use, um, is, is a thing that people turn to when we're, we're feeling activated, you know, we need to come down or go up, um, and substance use can exacerbate PTSD symptoms and individuals with severe PTSD, uh, they're frequent perpetrators of violence. And there's two things that I want us to extract out of this, this slide specifically. Bruce Perry, he does a lot of work with uh, traumatized children and adults. He was on Oprah. He wrote a book with Oprah. Wonderful stuff. I encourage you all to read it. He said, the pleasure that comes from the relief of distress becomes a powerful reward. Right? So the, the pleasure that comes from the relief of stress becomes a powerful reward. The things that we engage in to make ourselves feel better when we're feeling diseased, uh, we're feeling um, uncomfortable, we're feeling uncertain and overwhelmed, that thing just becomes more reinforced, right? And for those of us who have struggled with or are struggling with substance use problems, alcohol use problems, um, that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, if you reward a behavior, it will continue. It will repeat. Um, in the news just recently, there was a guy by the name of Quincy Javon Allen. He killed four people in 2020, uh, 20, 2002, excuse me. And just recently, his death sentence was uh, overturned by a lower appeals court because they said that the judge who sentenced him to die 20 years earlier, they didn't consider his abusive childhood or his mental illness. And this guy had a significant, significant um, community violence history, right? And he turned out to be a guy who perpetuated violence which is sad, which is super sad. We lost those lives. Um, it goes to goes without saying, and we need to actually reinforce it here, that not all people with clinical PTSD or who use substances, that they are going to go on to perpetuate violence, right? Um, just like not all people who have never been diagnosed with PTSD, don't have PTSD, won't perpetuate violence, right? So we're not trying to stigmatize people with PTSD or use substances or a combination of both and say, ah, those people are dangerous. They're not, right? Um, and we're trying to figure that out. We get called to a lot of those individuals um, in the field. And again, we're trying to deal with them and manage them and, and support them in a way that is full of dignity and respect. So let's go ahead and take a break, folks. Um, all right, folks, thanks for coming back. Um, I hope you were able to take care of yourself if you needed some time just to reflect. <clears throat> you know, there's this skill in DBT that we teach people called uh, the tip skill, you know, and you like put really cold things on your face or wherever you're hot. And you guys saw me overheating a second ago. So I'm over here with like some ice packs on my body because I overheat. That's one of the things that uh, I'm gifted with. 
again, I told you guys we were having a really broad discussion. Thanks for some of the comments in the chat, um, just saying that we're kind of on the right on the right track, which is good. Um, but now we're going to jump into trauma. We're going to jump into grief, and then we're going to talk about self care. And uh, yeah, after being victims. After we are victimized or we witness community violence, you know, we can be left managing just acute stress symptoms, right? Not even full-blown clinical PTSD, but just having this prolonged stress response. Um, again, with the daily tragedies that bombard us and uh, are overwhelming on social media, the news, uh, we can be left feeling all these things, sad, anxious, angry, disgusted, hopeless, and helpless. And for some of us with PTSD, you know, we have these symptoms, which are there on the screen for, you know, the hyper arousal, the emotional constriction, which is like the not showing of, uh, the not showing of emotion. Um, we can have the feeling of hopelessness, like things aren't really going to get better. And we can have uh, the symptom of dissociation, um, disconnecting really from our thoughts, our feelings, our memories, and a sense of identity. Um, and as well as helplessness, you know, like feeling like even if we tried, nothing would change. And again, I, I'm not just speaking clinically. I'm also speaking from experience um, with some of these symptoms myself. Um, the number one predictor that someone's going to have clinical full-blown PTSD is disassociation, right? And there's a bunch of things out there that you can, like, there's like surveys and inventories you can uh, take to see if you have like this, this thing called disassociation. And, uh, you know, exposure to and victimization from community violence, it, it rewires our brain, right? That's the definition of um, this prolonged activation of the, the survival system, the fight or flight system. Um, it rewires our brain. And we're going to talk about a part of the brain that doesn't get a lot of, uh, it's not a sexy part of the brain, so it doesn't get any play. But, um, there's a part right, right, right here. We take, uh, we move the cortex, the neocortex, and there's a part of the brain called the insula. Um, and for trauma patients, this this part of the brain gets rewired. Um, this part of the brain, the insula, it integrates and interprets uh, inputs from the internal organs, and it generates a sense of being embodied. So, like when you're feeling cold or you're feeling like something internally, like maybe you're feeling like a stomach problem, like this is the part of the brain that tells you your stomach's hurting, right? Um, and trauma, unfortunately, it, it, it causes us to have these, um, again, this fracturing of ourself. Um, and it either makes us feel like somebody else or trauma can make us feel like nobody, right? Um, we become essentially strangers to ourselves because we're separate from our bodies. And if you think about disassociation as a coping mechanism during some traumatic event, it probably saved your life, right? Because you didn't feel the things that were going on, right? You went to another place. A lot of people will say they had depersonalization. I saw myself like I was floating above myself while looking down or uh, derealization. It kind of felt like a movie, right? So these things that are built into the human nervous system to keep us alive and are, have some protective quality, uh, it also harms us when they are turned on all the time. Uh, being constantly assaulted by, but consciously cut off from the origin of your bodily sensations, it can produce this symptom called alexithymia, or not being able to sense and communicate what's going on within you. The word alexithymia is Greek for not having feelings. I've worked with several trauma patients, uh, people with PTSD specifically, uh, personality disorders, people that have dissociative disorders. And it's really incredible uh, when we ask them, how are you feeling? They don't give us an emotion, right? They say, oh, I have a headache, my stomach hurts. You know, there's some type of somatic answer for what they're feeling. And, you know, these people may look angry and you say, you look mad and they say, no, I'm fine or you know, you can tell they're just uh, really deep in something and you say, hey, what's going on? You're like, you know, uh, I'm okay. And this isn't the traditional, like you ask your wife, how are things going? She says, fine. And you know, that's a fine. So you know, um, I'm just kidding, honey. She's on this. She's watching. Um, so not being able to discern what's going on with our internal sensations, um, it causes us 
to be out of touch with our needs. Um, it will cause us to not take care of ourselves. It, you know, if it involves eating the right amount of food or getting the amount, right amount of sleep, it's difficult to know how much you need. Um, I think this is kind of where we get to like emotional eating or even some of these other things. You know, Gabor Mate, he wrote a couple of books in the realm of hungry ghosts when the body says no. And he talks about this like stress disease connection. He also talks about these, uh, these issues with, you know, addiction and how we long for human warmth and connection. And maybe we replace that with, uh, with substances. I remember working with a young lady who had severe PTSD and she had uh, gastroparesis, you know, so her stomach literally was paralyzed. And there's all these other issues that come with that, you know, GERD and acid reflux and all these things. You know, she wasn't hungry, but she had to eat. She couldn't feel her stomach working. For whatever reason, the trauma that she experienced, it came out and manifested as her stomach was partially paralyzed. It was what we say like psychosomatic that turned into just a, a physical illness. Only by getting in touch with our body by connecting viscerally with ourselves, can we regain a, a sense of who we are, our priorities, our needs, and our values? We have to get in touch back with ourselves. I think about the slide that we had um, a little while ago with all the examples of the news um, in the last couple of years. And I have this sense that a lot of us are kind of having this like low grade alexithymia, right? We're alexithymic where someone asks us like, how are you feeling about blah, blah, blah. And it's kind of like, eh, I don't know. You know, I'm kind of dealing with these other things. I, I don't really have a feeling about that. Um, we, we barely have time to process and digest yesterday's events while anticipating tomorrow's tragic news, right? So let's talk about grief. There's a Persian proverb that says, a drowning man is not bothered by rain. I hope you guys like these like 90s graphics. I made these myself. Um, I love this proverb and it speaks some deep wisdom for us. You know, um, it seems that some of us were in the same position as this drowning man. You know, we're so overwhelmed. We're so overwhelmed and we can't be bothered by the next overwhelming thing here. There's no space for it. I don't have any bandwidth to talk about that or process that. Um, when, a, a drown, when a, a drowning man is not bothered by rain, right? When we experience tragedy, our routines, our rhythms, and our relationships are disrupted. And at times they're completely severed, right? Um, we can have grief and loss, not just with the loss of a loved one or a friend, as, as some of these lectures have said, but when the certainties of our lives are shaken and disrupted, right? We can experience feelings of grief and loss, right? Um, these tragic events, our personal crises, they can make us feel a loss of safety. We can grieve that. We can have a loss of relationship. We can have a loss of agency, feeling like there's nothing we can do to make, improve our life. Um, and for those of us who like, the way we overcome that and keep moving forward is we just kind of spiritually bypass that or emotionally bypass. And we're, we're unwilling or we don't have the capacity to make space for those painful emotions. You know, is it because we're having this alexithymia or we're numbed out, we're burnt out? You know, there's like, as you guys know, tasks of grief and stages of grief. If you're having alexithymia, you probably don't even know where you're at in that stage, right? Am I angry? Am I bargaining? Am I accepting? Um, am I, you know, all these things, it's difficult to know. Um, this is the water that we're wading into as well um, with uh, this collective grief, this collective PTSD that we're kind of dealing with. Some days, some days we're drowning, some days we're swimming in it. Some days we're surfing on it, right? This past month, my colleagues in the fire department and the sheriff's department, they were drowning. They were drowning in grief. As, as several of you know, these four first responders, three from the sheriff's department 
and one from the fire department here in uh, Bernalillo County. They were um, assisting fire crews in the East Mountain, in the East Mesa fire. And on their way back to town, their helicopter crashed and they, they passed away. Um, I knew three of these gentlemen. I didn't know the undersheriff, Larry Corrin, but I worked with uh, two of these guys on the regular. And this is the first um, in line of duty death for both of these departments in several, several years. And a couple of observations that I have, I really appreciated um, that these departments had like a grieving process. Like it's kind of like formal and some informal, but internally they had a whole procedure for when someone passes away. And they also had things for the public to participate in, right? You have a, a car there that was left out of a substation and people could go put letters in there or drop off flowers because these guys are part of our life as well in some form or fashion, right? The rituals, the traditions, the ceremonies that we have in our lives, um, the vigils, they're, they're, they're reaffirmations of the resiliency in our communities, right? Um, some people say that funerals aren't really for the person who passed away, but they're for us living people, right? These ceremonies are part of the rhythm of our life. They add meaning to our life, right? Um, they help us process the grief. And not only does, uh, do these ceremonies and funerals, rites of passage, are they displaying the resiliency in our community that we're going to get through this as a people, but it also reaffirms our value as a community, the value of human life, right? Um, we, we value real life heroes in our community, right? Who bravely put themselves in harm way for us. Um, and these, these tragedies, you know, the losing of these four lives, it, you know, it, it, in some way it transforms us and it transforms our lives, it transforms the, the communities that we live in. And Levine, he, uh, Peter Levine, he talks about uh, trauma resolution as a movement from being fixed, like a fixed state, being stuck to flowing again, right? Um, and he talks about trauma as physiological reactions bound up in our body that wreak havoc and having these kind of rituals restores, having these rhythms restored, it helps us to get unstuck. We get to return to the flow of life. Our life force is restored and the, the community life force also continues to flow. I talked to several of the sheriff's department kind of law enforcement officers and they had one thing to say consistently, you know, they were like, there's no bad guy to blame for this. There's no, they didn't get in a shootout. Um, there's really no one to blame. It was a tragic accident. Um, and I think when we talk about, you know, we're going to talk about community justice here in a second. Um, we're kind of always, when something bad happens, we want to be able to say that's the person that did it and point fingers, you know, and, and it, it allows us to displace our anger and our grief onto that person. There's something about that that is neurobiologically hardwired. And so over the past couple of weeks, me and my team, um, you know, we've, there's been a lot of tears and there's been a lot of laughter, you know, we, we create this space for all these different types of emotional reactions and the commentary. Um, and that's how we stay healthy. Right. And when we, and when we talk about these things and we have that space for these things, it makes us feel less alone, less helpless, less hopeless. That leads us to kind of this idea of resiliency or post-traumatic growth, which are kind of two different things, and we'll talk about it. So let's tell a story. Uh, when trees are grown in the absence of wind, you know, like there's a bubble around a tree, wind can't push them over, they only grow to a certain height, and they just kind of flop over, right? There's something super critical about the wind pushing the trees that makes them grow tall and grow strong, right? And this is true for us. In order to grow tall and resilient and strong, we need adversity. We need desirable difficulty in our life. And this is kind of what we call dose dependent. Too much, and you can have acute stress, traumatic stress, but just enough, and you, you grow strong, you grow tall. I think this is what also Dr. Peter Levine is talking about in his book, Waking the Tiger. I know some of you have read that uh, or have referenced it. After we renegotiate and integrate trauma back into our nervous system, uh, we're left changed. 
on the other side of adversity and trauma, there's resiliency, right? And this thing called post-traumatic growth. I liked this quote from um, Dr. Levine's book. Resilient strength is the opposite of helplessness. Resilient strength is the opposite of helplessness. We become more resilient. Our families become more resilient. Our communities can, can become more resilient. Can, right? That's the, the word. We get more adept at weathering the storm, the stormy seasons of our life. Uh, and obviously finding resilience and becoming resilient, like you don't have to have a traumatic experience to achieve that, right? When you talk to, if you get the opportunity to talk to, talk to a veteran who's been in war, you know, and they got some amazing award, like the Purple Heart or the Medal of Honor, you know, they're not excited about the actions that they had to take to survive or save others. Most wish they didn't have to do those things to be honored, right? Because the cost of that is, you know, sometimes PTSD or trauma and nightmares and chronic pain and uh, nerve pain, right? Or amputations, terrible things. Um, and so we talk about this thing about resiliency, right? One of my superpowers because of my history is, man, I can stay super calm during chaos. I can talk to people in the midst of, of crisis and I can just be super steely calm. Maybe it's dissociation. Maybe it's numbness. I think I've mastered some of this because I'm in touch with my body and those internal sensations and the, the, the bells. Um, and that's one of my superpowers. I'm, I'm kind of grateful for that gift, right? Um, but it came at a cost. Uh, people that have post-traumatic growth, what's significant about that is uh, during these difficult experiences in the aftermath, they, they change their lives, according to the research, in four different areas. They relate to others differently. They have this sense of new possibilities in their life. They find personal strength and uh, spiritual change factors, like maybe even they change religions or they say, I'm not religious anymore. I don't practice an organized religion, but I'm really close to you know, God or the universe or whatever that is for them. And a new appreciation for life, right? So, so we're changed fundamentally sometimes. And how can we take care of ourselves uh, with all the things happening in the world here locally, uh, the things that are going to happen tomorrow, folks? Uh, how can we connect to our life force? How can we connect to our purpose and connect to our value system, right? How do we move out of being helpless or hopeless and move to a place of growth, hopefulness, and restoration? I've been, I've been building you guys up for this last kind of 10 slides here, okay? Let's talk about self-care in tough times. You guys are made of star stuff. Ted, I hope you like my graphics. I made most of them. You know, I like to do that stuff. I'm like techie. So I'm not going to give you guys standard advice, right? Or even like, um, like do X, Y, and Z, and you know, you're going to get better. And this is going to feel better. But I'm going to just give you some general ideas and principles about like how to maybe think about incorporating them. And I encourage you to talk to them with the people around you. You know, when we talk about self-care, we talk about like the most basic stuff. Eat adequately, get good sleep, take your medications, exercise, talk to your support system. You know, if that's good advice. But if you're feeling Alex Steinick, you're feeling numb, you're even dissociating, that's, you know, that's something you're going through. Um, it's pretty, it's probably pretty difficult to know what you're feeling, right? If you're hungry, you're tired, you're thirsty, your stomach hurts, right? Or you're feeling whatever, sad, uh, angry. You know, we misperceive when we're Alex Slimic, we misperceive and misinterpret our emotions and the signals internally. And therefore we can't act in our best interests, right? So my encouragement is simple. It's going to be get back into your body, get back into your body. And that's, you know, just that me saying that it sounds like something you'd hear in like a weird side sci-fi movie where like the character has left their physical body and they're like traveling or something and they got to get back into their body before they can. Or uh, something you'd hear about like a ghost who searching for a body, like get back into your body. Right. And I don't think that's like frou-frou kind of advice. Right. And we're going to talk a little bit about, about, 
So self-awareness, physical self-awareness internally, it's the first step in releasing the tyranny of the past. You know, Bessel van der Kolk said that. And people with alexithymia, we get better only by learning to recognize the relationship between our physical sensations and our emotions. They're a package, right? Trauma splits that package up. Uh, and I realized that like at baseline, some of us, we don't feel safe in our bodies. And so that becomes the work, right? Especially uh, in therapy or, or clinically, we can learn to befriend the sensations of our body. We can learn to tolerate our sensations. We can befriend our inner experience and cultivate new action patterns. We can build capacity to deal with physical and emotional distress. I've worked in several trauma programs where we do like yoga, trauma-informed yoga or mindfulness. And man, you know, there's a mindfulness um, group exercise that we do called uh, loving kindness and getting together with a group, a room of people who have trauma, especially trauma from people in their life. It's really hard. One of the practices is that we send loving kindness to other people. We send loving kindness maybe to the person that hurt us. And then we send loving kindness to ourselves. That last part, people who have been severely traumatized, it's really hard to send loving kindness to ourselves because that makes us feel icky or weird. Or, you know, we have some um, maybe distorted perceptions that we don't deserve that love or that kindness, right? So, so, so we do these things. We're going to take a quick trip to neurobiology and talk about this for a quick second. This upside down triangle is your brain, right? At the very top, you have the cortex, the neocortex, and you got the limbic system. It's like the social emotional kind of levels. And then you have the diencephalon and the brain stem, right? So we're just gonna use this as our example of the brain. Um, up here, we can think abstractly, we can plan for the future. We have all these executive functioning, um, all these wonderful things. It's the most humane part of us. And when we're calm, I like to give the example of like, I just woke up. I don't have anything to do. I jump in the shower. It's just me in the shower in the warm water. And I feel so calm. And I'm you're having conversations in your head. You're solving problems you didn't even know you had. The world's problems, right? You feel so you're up here. And then you start going through your day or you have a conflict with someone at work or whatever. And you're down here. You're in emotion mind, right? And the rational part of your brain, you just want to give everyone a piece of your mind. And then you're down here in the brainstem too. If it escalates, right? You're not even thinking about that stuff. You can't even have conflict with people because you're going to go nuclear, right? You're thinking of fight, flight, or freeze over here. Right? Sometimes it's fight. So we have this example of the brain. Um, when we are activated, right? When we're activated and we're in hyper arousal, right? We start feeling keyed up. Um, we're operating out of these primitive brain structures evolutionarily, right? The brainstem, the midbrain structures there. And our brainstem down here that's where our circadian rhythm lives. That's where our digestion lives. Uh, you know, down here, we have the cerebellum where, you know, it, it regulates balance and coordination and movement and motor skills. So if you think about it, when you're escalated and you're not operating from up here, you're down here, you know, and think about it, you're in fight, flight, or freeze, right? Your body knows how to keep you safe, right? That's why your, your muscle tone increases when you think there's danger, right? And the blood starts pulling away from your body into your lungs and organs. Because if you get into a fight and get hurt up here, you ain't going to bleed, right? Your, your, your body has this incredible, insane wisdom to it. So we, we, we regulate. We're going to talk about that. You see the orange text up there. Um, so how do we calm ourselves when we're physiologically regulated, right? The chemicals and all the things inside of our body, we're, we're, we're calm, we're regulated, we're our most humane, we're our most rational self, and we have access to that, again, that uh, higher order thinking. Um, the strategy to get back in your body is to engage in what we call bottom-up regulation strategies, right? So if you're down here, and you all know this to be deeply true for your kids, for you, your family, right? If someone's down here, they're right here, they're angry, right? They're, man, their hands are up. And you say, calm down, let's think about this, right? And you're telling them to think, guess what, y'all? They ain't thinking, right? They're not up here, they're down here. So if part of the brain, the part of the brain that's regulating our behavior because of, we, 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 our behavior is state dependent, right? Our behavior is dependent on our level of arousal. 
then what we got to do is bottom up regulation strategies, right? Body based, patterned, repetitive, rhythmic, sensory activities to regulate the brainstem, right? These things, and I'll give you some examples. Maybe you can think of some. Uh, they create rhythm, they create safety, and they create relationship, right? We do this in therapy with kids all the time and, and, and individuals, adults, when we teach them to regulate themselves when they're feeling escalated, when they're in emotion mind, right? How do they um, take care of themselves, right? Some people do tapping. Some people, you know, think about when your baby's crying, you know, you rock your baby. This is a rhythm, right? Left, right, left, right. When we study mothers who are rocking their baby, it's incredibly uh, coincidental that they rock at the same rate as their heartbeat. And guess what a baby was listening to in utero during the pregnancy? A heartbeat, right? There's no other thing that's more rhythmic. Bop, 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 bop. Rhythm, pattern rhythm is regulating to our brainstem, right? Our brainstems like patterned rhythms because that's how this thing works, right? We have our sleep-wake cycle. You have a whole day, you sleep, you wake up, you sleep, you wake up. Um, I would do a lot of sports with kids during therapy, during play therapy, right? And we're bouncing the ball. Bop, 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 bop. There's some pattern, repetitive, rhythmic activity uh, that we get to do. Singing is amazing for this, right? Uh, songs are very melodic. There's a rhythm, there's a pattern. Listening to music, I know when some of us get upset or escalated, you know, we throw in our music immediately or we put something on. Uh, these things regulate the brainstem. They help us to move out of fight, flight, or freeze and move into what Stephen Porges calls uh, the ventral vagal system, right? You activate the parasympathetic nervous system. This system is called the rest and digest system. This is a polyvagal chart. We're looking at the green. This is the part we're looking at. You can find this chart online, guys, if you want to look up polyvagal. When we're regulated, we've come out of fight, flight, or freeze, and we're in our most social, right? We're in this state. Uh, this is the, the amazing things that we can do. And we've all felt this, right? When we're calm, we feel connected to people. We feel settled. We feel grounded. Uh, we're compassionate. We're mindful. We can think of the future. Um, this is all neurobiologically accurate. And this, you know, there's like a little um, bell curve right here. There's a distribution in this whole chart. And I like to think of this as like a wave, right? Like you have like a normal day, you're in traffic, you get way up here to being angry because someone's being slow. And then you get down here, you know, it's like a normal day. You're vacillating and oscillating through these states all day. You can't just stay in ventral vagal in this green area where things are amazing because guess what? Your nervous system is made to respond to stress to keep you alive. So you see, you see this wave, it's like flowing forever for us, right? Uh, up and down, we move in and out of these emotional states. And uh, we, we can learn to tolerate these sensations of our body. We can learn that we can hold space for ourselves, for our sensations, and for other people, right? Um, in tough times, we don't have to hold this space alone. Uh, we, hold it, we hold it for others all the time. I know several people where we're like, man, I'm like their therapist, you know, like they call me, but I never call anyone to say I'm having a bad day. Right. I wonder why that is. Uh, maybe that's something we learned in childhood or that was the, the messaging that we got. I think someone already put in the, the chart, you know, like big boys or, you know, men don't cry or don't have emotions, something like that. It's okay to let others hold the space for you. So, you know, we're talking about getting back in the body. Right. That's my first piece of encouragement for you all. And the second one is uh, this idea of like holding space or creating space. When we're exposed to or the victims of community violence, unfortunately, our support system is also affected. Right. One homicide in a neighborhood can affect 200 people. You know, it's difficult to call someone who's also struggling. Right. Because um, they may not be able to hold space for you. But in therapy, you know, uh, we have a saying, you know, hold the space and trust the process. And being in communion with other people is what we call co-regulating, right? 
um, listening to other people. It's kind of what, what's so powerful about groups, the group setting and, and group counseling and, and IOP and all these things, you know, um, it's, it's, it's nice to feel like you're not alone in some of these things. Right. Um, so, you know, if, if you've been deeply hurt by humans, other humans, or you have attachment injuries, um, the work that is to the part of ourselves that need that care, right? Uh, we got to go back and talk to our wounded, our wounded child. Especially if the relationship that was ruptured and injured can't be repaired, and you gotta, you gotta move on. If you're feeling like you're doing all this work all alone, definitely seek out support, right? That becomes the work. Uh, build a support network. Get a group of friends. Find a therapist. Everything is super online now. And there's like wonderful online communities that are supportive. Uh, we, we need actual humans that are supportive. Uh, to have healthy, robust relationships with others, they need to have a reciprocal relationship with each other, right? It's give and take. And uh, I know for some of us, it just feels like give, give, give. The power of talk therapy, you know, I'm a clinician. I'm always recommending go to therapy to people. Um, it's just that when you go do talk therapy, it's just sitting and talking, you know, the therapist patient dynamic, it's, it's a good model for what it looks like to create a literal space to process difficult things. Right. Um, and when we get to have that in our life, when we have someone, just even one person that we can call and we know they're going to give us um, a non-judgmental, empathetic, and they're going to be patient with us, uh, response, man, it helps us to feel, and I love Ted's words, seen, heard, and valued, right? Um, and so if, if, if our biological rhythms are like this, right, and trauma disrupts those, uh, we can build safety and rhythm within relationships as well, right? We hold the space for these things in our life as well. At the macro level, at the big level, we have rituals, traditions, anniversaries every year that it's coming, right? My birthday's coming up. Christmas is coming up. Thanksgiving's coming up. Ramadan's coming up. Whatever it is, every culture in human history celebrates these holidays. You know, I think of uh, winter solstice, summer solstice, um, birthdays again, um, and just like the seasons, the rhythms of our relationships are regulated. We can set our clock by these things, right? Relationships create patterns of predictability. Predictability equals less uncertainty and less uncertainty equals safety, right? And again, when, when we experience all these terrible things in the news and the, the community violence that comes out um, every day and we're experiencing grief and loss and alexithymia, our rhythms are disrupted. It's super important to keep your schedule, right? It's super important to, to have some predictability to your life. Um, Getting in touch with our internal world, getting in, getting back into our bodies, it actually allows us to appropriately respond to the external world, right? We can restore our daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly routines and rhythms. When COVID came out, immediately, you know, they're like, don't, don't go to the gym, don't go to this thing. It's like, I, I continue to work out. I continue to get on my bike. I continue to work out in the garage, you know, because that's such an important rhythm for me. Uh, uh, important ritual for me. And uh, one of my friends was, was commenting on it. He said, no matter what the world is doing, you're always, you know, you're always staying true to that. And I, I appreciated that. Uh, interesting article recently found that, uh, and I just love the headline, you know, the secret to a happy family is holding space for unhappiness, holding space for what we'd consider like a negative emotion, right? Uh, how many of us grew up in a family where it was, there was no space for like, criticism, no space for anger, no space for uh, a different opinion. And so what do we do? We constrict, right? We, we hold that stuff in that makes you sick. You're only as sick as your deepest secret, as my uh, one of my colleagues used to say. Um, so how do we hold space for ourselves, for our families? So, so far, you know, we've covered concepts about taking care of ourselves, befriending our sensations in our body, uh, engaging in pattern, repetitive, rhythmic, sensory activities uh, to regulate our nervous system. Uh, we've talked about holding space and learning how to create that space for ourselves and others. Um, 
And community violence, you know, it's such it's such a public thing, right? That I've been I've been thinking about what repair looks like at the community level, right? Uh, does 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 displays of justice served in the news uh, in the courts help us to heal from trauma that's born of community violence, right? How important is it for like someone to get a criminal sentence when they've committed an atrocious act that helps us to feel closure, help us to heal some of that, right? It's, it's a difficult conversation, but we're going to broach it. Um, so interestingly enough, the community violence that's been happening like in the past few years are getting justice, what seems like in the last couple of weeks, right? And are these displays of justice served, sentences being handed out, uh, accountability being uh, given to people, is, is that self-care when it comes to these things, community violence and community justice? In the news recently uh, was the Parkland high school shooting in, uh, that happened in 2018. This is a picture of one of the fathers of uh, a parent who died, who uh, is testifying in court. It's very emotional. Uh, they're doing a sentencing hearing for the guy who, who killed everyone, which is sad, right? And it's been like, what, four years? Um, recently, uh, the FBI arrested uh, several police officers who uh, murdered Breonna Taylor in her home when she was sleeping. Like, that's a big deal. And we've been, we've been waiting for some, some stuff to come out about that. The Pope recently issued an apology uh, to the peop people of the world in Canada of the historical abuse and deaths of Indigenous children. These, they found these mass graves in the Pope. The Catholic Church has said, we're sorry for our conduct, right? Because those were Catholic institutions. Alex Jones was in the news. Um, in 2018, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, had a mass shooting. 17 students and staff were killed. This guy, um, he has been saying that Sandy Hook has been a hoax and that the parents and the children were actors. And it's caused all of this in insane grief and trauma for these families who lost their kids. And he's been ordered to pay a lot of money in uh, damages, in punitive damages. He has another case pending in Texas and another case pending for the same stuff in Connecticut. So like how much of that is going to help the families? The compensation is going to help them to feel closure. I don't know. And even for us, right, um, as just the public who is exposed to these things. The Senate just passed a bill um, that's going to cut potentially cut greenhouse gases uh, and emissions by 40%. They're saying it's going to be below 2005 levels uh, in eight years by 2030, right? Yesterday, um, Mara Largo, Trump's uh, safe haven in Florida, was raided by the FBI. They seized a bunch of boxes of stuff. Um, they, served, they served a warrant on him. They're probably going to come with criminal indictment over some things that has happened during his pregnancy and possibly what happened on January 6th, inc incitement of violence, as well as, you know, this um, January 6th legislative committee have been airing these primetime hearings, um, hearing testimony from people within his uh, Republican Party. And we'll see what happens with that, right? There's like going to be an outcome with that. Again, uh, for the people who lost family members and injuries on that day, uh, January 6th, will there be closure? They're dealing with trauma and grief, right? All these things. Again, we're trying to kind of summarize it up from the first slide that we saw. All these developments that are happening in the world right now, in the nation, in our nation, um, they make me think of the goal of community justice uh, type programs, right? And moreover, I, I link these, these things, these things you're seeing right now on the screen to behavior change, right? Um, to change to change the way we think as a community, as a society, to avoid the missteps of the past that got us here, right? When people come into therapy, we say, stop doing the things that you're doing so you don't get what you always got. That's not easy, right? Because if you could do it, you'd do it. Um, again, that's why we use all these approaches to like tease all that stuff apart, right? Let me read you the definition of community justice, right? Uh, community justice policies confront crime and delinquency through proactive problem-solving problem-solving practices aimed at prevention, 
control, reduction, and reparation of the harm crime has caused. The goal of community justice programs is to create and maintain vital, healthy, safe, and just communities to improve the quality of life for all citizens. We have a program um, here in Albuquerque with Albuquerque Police Department of like previous gang members who go out and talk to like current gang members and they're doing this thing, community justice, and we need it. We're gonna break a record of homicides this year. One of the subtitles there is uh, community justice and metanoia, right? And uh, metanoia in Greek is to change one's mind. In English, when we translate metanoia to English, it's the word repentance. So repentance is to change one's mind, right? And we think of the word repent when we think of repentance, like being remorseful for previous actions and uh, commitment to behavior change, right? And I, and I think of these things, and I think of what, what the Greek Orthodox Church teaches about metanoia, about repentance. And they say um, it denotes a change of mind, a reorientation, a fundamental transformation of outlook, of man's vision of the world to himself, of himself, and uh, a new way of loving others and God. And uh, it makes me think of like when you're stuck in traffic and you're super pissed off because you got to, you know, you got to go to work and you're like, ah, oh, this traffic sucks, but you're, you're actually traffic. Like you're one of the cars that's in traffic. You are traffic, you know, like what's the reframing or thinking that we have to have for all of us to envision a, a better place in our world? You know, it, it just even in our little slice of the world. Um, I like this quote by Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, reconnecting to our body is the first step because that reconnects us to our values, that reconnects us to our bodily wisdom and it reconnects us to our mission, right? Um, we grow, we evolve, we become more resilient. We have the capacity to do that. And for me, for Gilbert Valdez, you know, this is the mission of my life. I'm a clinical counselor. Um, I, I'm here to serve the people. Um, Alexander Shia, he's a psychologist. He comes from New Mexico. He spends a lot of time out at Ghost Ranch. And he says, you know, we're a tribe of tribes. We're a tribe of of tribes. It's okay to have your tribe, but you're part of this bigger deal, right? And we're here to serve all of, all of, all of us. I'm trying to make my part of the world a little safer, a little, a little better. And I'm, I want to leave it better than when I found it. That's Gilbert's mission, right? And, and I think I achieved that. Um, I try really hard. And the world, folks, the world isn't over, right? We, we still have work to do. We still have people to serve, right? Um, Despite the bad news, the world isn't over. Let's get to work. And finally, reconnecting to our bodily sensations after periods of like Alex Thymia, um, you know, the numbness and the constriction. Uh, we, when we reconnect to our body, we, we reconnect to the meaning of our life, right? And I like this quote by Nietzsche, who has a why to live can bear almost any how. Viktor Frankl also said that. He was a survivor of the Holocaust. He was a psychologist. He wrote a book. He was a psychiatrist. Um, are you guys in touch with your why? Right? I wake up every day because I have this beautiful family. And uh, I, I, I gotta, I'm serving them, right? Everything I do is for them. I work hard for them. Recently, we took a vacation, a family vacation. It was wonderful. It was super stressful traveling with three kids. Um, amidst COVID and monkeypox, you know, fear of shootings and all this stuff. And uh, we, we made some incredibly just like normal memories, right? Just ordinary mundane memories, but there's, there's magic in the mundane. There's miracles in the mundane. Um, the sacred is right there smack dab in the struggle with it, right? And I, I snapped this picture. We went to San Diego, San Diego Zoo, you know, and we're just like moving around. We're trying to get in. We're getting through the crowds. And we were like, Where, which way should we go? It's huge. I, if you get a chance, go to San Diego Zoo. It's amazing. And we went down this like uh, place where the birds are. And we had the place all to ourselves. You know, it was amazing. And for one, for one, one second, I felt this peacefulness. I took a deep breath. I felt this serenity that I haven't felt in a long time. And uh, 
I touched it and it passed, it moved on to the next person. And, you know, and I was, it was good. And it was awesome. And we kept moving, you know, and we got to feed the kids, change the diapers. And it's hot. You know, so like all the, all the stuff comes in at life. Um, it was awesome. And, and, and these are, these are my why right here. This is why I do it. Um, how did a, how did a kid, a traumatized kid from the North Valley of Albuquerque, New Mexico, you know, how did I get here? How did I get so lucky? Um, not unscathed, but, but, but wiser than I once was, you know, um, this is the water we're swimming in y'all and, uh, mindfulness, uh, observing what's going on internally for us. It helps us to understand that this is the water that we're in. This is water. Um, we coexist in it and we co-create our reality every day. And, uh, we have the ability to change the water. You have the ability to change your circumstances. You have the ability to change your, your thinking and your thoughts. You have the ability to do these things to improve ourselves and improve our world. So I think the future is in good hands. I say that all the time. I, I see these kids out here doing amazing things in the world. I'm like, man, the, the future is in good hands. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, if you have questions or comments, you can email me. You can also uh, message me. That's my uh, personal cell there. And uh, I'd love to uh, like engage with you all if you have any questions. And um, you know, and if you want any of the like slides that you guys saw, please message me. Uh, again, I, I like making graphics and stuff. I like doing words over text and all these things. So if any of those were of interest to you, please message me and I will send you them. Okay. Again, it's been it's been awesome seeing you guys. I really uh, appreciate and I'm super honored to be here and. and be among the, the people here. Uh, you guys are my gente, you know, and I'm, I'm here to, to serve you guys. I appreciate you being our gente and you vice versa. Gilbert, you and I have gotten to be brothers for a long time and I appreciate that. And, you know, we all get to be those miracles in the mundane as well as the healing and the trauma so that we can find those miracles. And uh, I hope everybody realizes what a miracle you are and to appreciate your family and your time and your wisdom. I really appreciate you as you know, and you'll continue to know. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. And I will also take you out and you can beat me up on a golf course sometime. How's that sound? I am looking forward to that. Really <laughs> Thank you so much, Gilbert. I really appreciate it. And uh, sending you love and blessings to your family as well as all the work you're doing down in Albuquerque and We'll keep doing our work up here as we continue to heal and grow as well. Thanks so much. I love it. Keep it up, everyone. And thanks, guys. I'll see you guys. I hope to see you guys soon.